Hello and welcome back. Here's why you need to watch today's episode. First, we're going to discuss the fallout from the Solana exploit. It's continuing. Solana developers are claiming that the open source, slope, closed source, slope wallet may be to blame. I know we've seen issues with the Solana blockchain before. And if you're asking yourself, is this another problem with the blockchain? Should I be concerned about my Solana? Rest assured that this is a wallet issue, an application built on top of the blockchain. The blockchain is currently operating as usual. We're also going to have our monthly check-in with Rect Capital. He's back to share his good old fashion technical analysis as everyone continues to ask have we found the bottom we're going to hear exactly what rect has to say this is your real vision crypto daily briefing my name is mark Oliveira, and with me today we have as always ash bennington let's kick things off and talk about the latest price action so despite yesterday's exploit of solana solana seems to be trading sideways up roughly half a percent over the last 24 hours that seems to be the name of the game today for the top 10 coins. Bitcoin has barely moved in the last 24 hours, up roughly 0.12%. Ethereum basically finds itself in the same boat. Despite the growing, growing enthusiasm for the upcoming merge, Ethereum is down just 0.19% this morning. And then here are the top stories we're going to cover today. So the first story we're going to cover, the Solana hack and what we know. So with the dust starting to clear from this Solana exploit, we have a better idea of what happened and why. Ash, tell me, what have we learned in the past 24 hours? Well, what we've learned in the past 24 hours is that, uh, exactly as you said, this is a an external wallet, uh, a, a hot wallet for the Solana blockchain where the flaw was. What we've also learned is that there's a great deal of strum and drang about the exact nature of the cause, how uh, precisely the, uh, the security flaw worked was implemented by the exploit. Uh, I think what we've learned in the broader sense as we continue to reinforce this, what we are talking about here is software, right? Cryptocurrencies are software with all the attendant complexities that come with troubleshooting software. So it's going to take some time before we get to the bottom of exactly what went wrong here. Lots of theories flying around on Twitter, lots of folks close to the projects weighing in. But in terms of a definitive outcome, a definitive cause, we don't have it yet. And do you think, I mean, you, you mentioned a lot of theories floating around there. Do you think it's going to have a lasting impact on Solana? Well, look, I, I think Solana is obviously um, a, a protocol that's had some challenges in the past. I think it's going to have a lasting impact on the industry. I think that all of these uh, types of the cumulative sum uh, of all the challenges that we see in terms of software flaws begins to add up. Um, you know, I was asked yesterday about, uh, you know, is it surprising that there are there that there are exploits happening? And I said, it's it's like being surprised that your pet tiger bites you. This is still a very early stage industry. Um, software is inherently incredibly complex. Coordinating development between open source projects and closed source product projects is a non-trivial task. Um, we're going to have to continue to work through these issues uh, as these platforms mature. But don't look for these types of exploits to disappear and anytime soon, Marco. Well, on that note of exploits, uh, Chainalysis, uh, they recently released a report on uh, cross-platform hacks. Ash, I know that you are kind of in tune with that report. What's going on with that? Yeah, so this is about bridges. So uh, bridges have been something that we've been talking about as a potential security issue on Real Vision now for many months. Uh, I read a quote yesterday from Corby Pryor, uh, who's been on Real Vision before, talking about precisely these kind of issues. You know, Corby's take on this, and one that I think has been borne out uh, in terms of the actual results that we've seen, is that unless you have consensus mechanisms securing the underlying validity of a blockchain, it is very difficult to have these cross platform software bridges uh, conduct these um, operations where you're transferring between chains with security. Uh, you know, you look at this chart, pretty obvious here. I think the number uh, that you, you cited there, about $2 billion in, in total value lost from bridge attacks. This is considerable. This is material. Again, this is a challenge that's probably here to stay for some time, Marco. Well, as we're speaking at losses, there's also some gainers. The next story we're going to look at here is Michael Saylor transitioning to become MicroStrategy's executive chairman. Obviously, we reported on this yesterday. Ash, I hear there have been some interesting developments, again, in the past 24 hours. What's going on? What are you seeing? Well, uh, the short answer is uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, that MicroStrategy uh, has increased uh, about 66%. We've seen some pretty dramatic uh, upswings uh, in the stock here uh, over the last one month. This is uh, so this is sort of like uh, I was joking around earlier this morning. This is kind of like you know when you're in a relationship, it's really new and like no matter what happens, the other thing, the thing that the other person does is like super cute. That's kind of the way that bull markets work. News gets interpreted in the most positive way, and of course the converse is true in bear markets. So what we've seen here in terms of the messaging coming out of uh, MicroStrategy is this notion that Michael Saylor is going to be moving from his CEO role to an executive chairman role. By the way, this is relatively common uh, at companies where you. You've, you've seen uh, CEOs in place for decades. They often take a, a move into the executive chair role so that they can uh, be freed up from some of the day-to-day -day responsibilities to handle some more strategic thinking for the company. Uh, in this particular case, MicroStrategy, excuse me, MicroStrategy has cited the explicit uh, objective of Michael Saylor having more time to focus on Bitcoin and Bitcoin acquisition. The market seems to like that interpretation. Uh, again, uh, you know, this has been a little bit of a relief rally as we've seen across crypto from the lows. Uh, so it's it's the sentiment is just broadly positive, and it seems like everything is catching a bid uh, on any news uh, that comes out when you tell the story uh, in a way that's consistent with that broader narrative, Marco. You know, Ash, I, I thought that tweet was really funny because when he said, in my next job, I intend to focus more on Bitcoin, I was like, well, isn't that what you've been doing, bro? <laughs> so really funny story. Uh, on, right. that, uh, on a different note, uh, pivoting, breaking story, BlackRock and Coinbase partnership. BlackRock and Coinbase have announced the partnership. Mutual customers of both platforms are going to have access to crypto trading through this management platform, Aladdin. Coin shares up significantly today, and there's even reports on Twitter that Robinhood is halting trading due to volatility. This is, of course, a developing story. Ash, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's kind of a it's kind of a story that gives a certain layer of uh, of credibility to the the whole broader digital asset space uh, that BlackRock is getting into. It BlackRock, of course, uh, the world's largest private asset manager. I think about ten trillion dollars in AUM. Uh, obviously, a, a massive number, uh, and it's hard to see this as anything other than um, you know a, a kind of broader acceptance of the digital asset crypto space by mainstream Wall Street. It doesn't get any bigger than BlackRock. Uh, I should say if you uh, if you cover financial services as I do uh, the folks from BlackRock whenever I run into them uh, at a party or a bar and you try and uh, get information out of them they're notoriously tight-lipped around the cryptocurrency uh, story and what they're doing in that space so this really is kind of a, a major stamp of approval I would say for digital assets from mainstream Wall Street amazing well so on the notes of you know Prices increasing in these two stocks. We, that brings us to our first clip of the day. I sat down with the technical analyst, Rec Capital. He's the author of the Rec Capital newsletter. And it was really great to get his analysis on Bitcoin. The thing I like about Rec a lot is that he has this very down-to-earth, simple-to-understand commentary, and that makes him really unique in the space of technical analysts. And in this first clip, we discuss the 200-week moving average. And this is important for viewers because right now we're trading right on that sideways, right on that line, on that moving average. Many traders are waiting to see what's going to happen next. Let's take a listen to what Rec has, has to say. And I want to kick things off talking about this current retest of the 200-week moving average that we have here. What's going on with this chart, Rick? Yeah, the 200-week moving average, this blue line here, that used to be historically a bottoming signal for Bitcoin's price action. For the first time, really, we're seeing an extended period of time where Bitcoin was really consolidating below that 200-week moving average. And recently, only last week, Bitcoin was able to close, weekly candle close above the 200 a week moving average for the first time since uh, March 2020, really. So now Bitcoin is pulling back, it is dipping, trying to secure that retest to turn this old resistance into a new support and in an effort to really just springboard towards higher levels. But at the moment, this retest is quite key, but it doesn't necessarily have to be successful because we're seeing loads of different trends going on uh, right now in this market cycle relative to this 200 week moving average. Previously, we just see downside wicking, for instance, below the moving average before really quickly uh, recovering back above it. 
in this market cycle, we're actually seeing a lot of consolidation. And now this retest, of course, just like in March 2020, that retest was successful. But this retest right over here, we have to be open to the fact that it might not be successful and we could still see uh, a drop into the uh, 20K, even sub 20K region, because this is still technically a bottoming out process for Bitcoin. So let's say that it does re like successfully retest this 200 week moving average. Where could we see the next level of like resistance at? Where would it, the price do you think would could go if that scenario played out? That's a good question because uh, Bitcoin enjoyed or at least experienced a strong, sharp uh, continuation in the downtrend when it lost uh, the 28K region. And um, a few months ago, uh, Bitcoin was still occupying the 28K to 69K uh, macro range where Bitcoin was just consolidating for a few months, bouncing from 28K rallying towards the mid 60s before dropping back down again. So that was a macro range. And if Bitcoin were to successfully retest this 200 week moving average as a support, the underside of that macro range would likely be a major resistance because that was once a major support. And at the same time, we don't have many higher time frame resistances on the way to that 28K, 30K region. So if we do indeed rebound and continue from here, in what may be a relief rally from Bitcoin, then there isn't much resistance to resist that move towards uh, that uh, low, that range low of the macro range. So 28K to 30K. So Ash, that was a really interesting clip there. For the viewers who don't know what the 200 week moving average is, can you give us a quick breakdown of what this indicator is and its significance? Yeah, Marco, it's the average price over a nearly four year period, 3.8 years. Uh, it's a very long term, slow moving average. Uh, longer term moving averages are helpful for getting a very long term view of the overall trajectory of price movement. Uh, and it's interesting to note in Rex view, uh, this was a historic bottoming signal. Uh, it closed above it for the first time since March of 2020. Uh, Rect is also talking about 20,000 uh, being a potential resistance level uh, in terms of uh, his view of the technicals on this, uh, in addition to the moving average. Uh, so that's his view of this. And it's an interesting one because he really does frame this, I think you mentioned this at the top of the show, uh, in a very big picture kind of way. Uh, and I think the clip that we just saw there uh, speaks to exactly that point, Marco. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think something else that really struck me about this clip is that the first time is this is the first time that he was saying that we got multiple candle closes below this 200 week moving average. In other yeah. parts of the interview, he was talking about normally we just wick below it really quickly and then recover pretty fast in a kind of a V shape type of way. And that already kind of has some implications, right? I mean, it kind of shows that this bear cycle is definitely different than the previous ones, but who knows how significant that is? Does it mean it's going to be a longer bear cycle or lower prices? Uh, only time is going to tell us the significance of this, but I definitely think it's something to keep an eye on. Um, so with that said, let's turn our attention to the next clip where Rec discusses why he believes Bitcoin's price below 35K is a bargain. I've also seen you tweet that anything sub 35K is a good buying opportunity. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, data science suggests to us that um, the point of um, maximum financial opportunity, generational um, bottoming is below uh, 35,000. And this is an indicator that I referred to in the Rex Capital newsletter. And it was just the 200 year moving average um, or rather the two year moving average, apologies. And those are essentially uh, two moving averages. One um, with one of those, we see uh, downside deviation below them to form a bottoming out process for Bitcoin in the bear market. And then we see a deviation beyond the higher moving average, which is actually a multiplier of that initial moving average. And that's where we see sharp um, upside down V shaped reversals at peaks where we see a peak in the bull market. So uh, essentially the moving average that concerns us the most at this point in time in the cycle is uh, the bear market bottom one. So that's the two year moving average and uh, dropping below that two year moving average has historically preceded bear market bottoms. But we tend to see price drop down quite significantly below the two year moving average. 
So the two-year moving average at this point in time represents the price point of 35,000. So essentially, if Bitcoin is forming a bottoming out process in the bear market, starting from 35,000 all the way down to X, wherever that absolute bottom will be, then Bitcoin has been in a bottoming out process according to the data science model since 35K. So buying at 35K is still very much the, the top the range high of this uh, macro range of this bottoming out process. So the lower price goes, the closer we get to the absolute bottom. But data science is suggesting that anything below 35K is already the bottoming out process. Now, Ash, the viewers, the Real Vision community, they have dubbed you as aggressive ne aggressively neutral, Mr. Aggressively Neutral. With that in mind, tell me, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this clip? Well, again, this isn't my view. This is Rex's view. But Rex sees anything on Bitcoin below 35000 as a buying opportunity. Uh, it's interesting to listen to him describe it because it's a very long-term view, uh, which is, and by the way, we should say that's obviously considerably above uh, the current price. That's obviously bullish based on the price levels. You know, I don't have a view on price one way or the other, uh, especially in the short term, but it's really interesting to hear the way Rekt unpacks it, because often, you said this at the top of the show, Marco, often there's a lot of noise uh, in the the uh, the views or the feedback when you listen to technical analysts. With Rekt, you know exactly where he stands. He doesn't mince words, and he gives you this big 50,000 foot view uh, based on a longer term structural view of the price of Bitcoin. And, and frankly, I just find that a very interesting way uh, to look at uh, Bitcoin price, Marco. Yeah, Ash, I think it's a really important that you pointed out that this is a long term view and he's not mincing words. He's being very direct about his approach and his strategy is geared towards a long term view rather than short term trades. And before people start applying this strategy, they have to take that into consideration that he has a really long term view of, of Bitcoin. Well, moving on to the next clip. So this is where Rekt is talking about the 20 month moving average. A lot of people want to know just how long can this crypto bear market, this crypto winter could last. Let's hear what Rekt has to say about this bottoming cycle. I also want to focus on the amount of monthly candles that we see below the 20 month moving average when we see that breakdown from that moving average. In, in 2014, we saw one, two, three, four monthly candles form before that bottom was found, before that capitulation downside wick was, was had to, to just finish up that 63% retracement. In the 2018, 2019, the 2018 phase, uh, it took one, two monthly candles to form before that uh, final generational bottom was formed after a minus 52% retracement below the 20 month moving average. Right now in this cycle, we've seen one, two, three, and now this is the fourth candle that's currently forming. It's, it's just August um, turned right now, but we've seen only three monthly candles form below the 20 month moving average. And just by looking at the amount of candles, or at least how long it should take, uh, history is suggesting to us that it takes two to four months to find a bottom, and Bitcoin is in its third month, its, its fourth month. So still in the balance, still technically we could still find and look for that bottom going forward. But nonetheless, after that bottom forms, we, we can see that it takes a long time for that bottom bottoming out process to form. So maybe the absolute bottom might be in, but the bottoming out process and that multi-month consolidation lasts a, a fair amount. And uh, the final confirmation for long-term investors is to watch out for a break back beyond the 20-month moving average, because that would be evidence that a new macro uptrend and bull market is upon us. Very interesting. I think that's an important distinction that you just made there because you said that perhaps the bottom is already in, but the bottoming out process can take longer. Just to kind of reiterate what you're saying, we're about three months into this bottoming out process and it looks like they're, they're anywhere from six to 13 uh, bars, which means months that before we can see like a potential, like or the full bottom, before we start going towards the uptrend, the wave starts moving, or the tide starts shifting in the opposite direction. 
Yeah, exactly. So if we just think about um, periods below the 20 month moving average, we see down downtrend acceleration. So those two to four months of just capitulating, trying to find that absolute bear market bottom. And then we see multiple months of just sideways accumulation, um, trying to just solidify an accumulation range before, you know, just in preparation for breaking out from that sideways range. And uh, effectively challenging that 20 month moving average to confirm a new macro uptrend because theoretically anything below the 20 month uh, moving average uh, could could be whatever it could be relief it could be a bottoming out process but once that moving average is broken that's when the bullish sentiment is is taking over and we're seeing a, a, a total shift in uh, in market trends so going forward Definitely, we are in a period where perhaps the downtrend acceleration uh, has paused for the moment. There is still scope for some final acceleration, that final capitulation for new lows. We could still see that absolute bottom, but it shouldn't detract us from the fact that this is a bottoming out process and this bottoming out process will take uh, multiple months and occur within a relatively wide range, like I mentioned earlier, and, and you alluded to Marco with the data science model, anything below uh, 35,000 is, is the beginning of the bottoming out process. So people are worrying about um, buying Bitcoin at 21K, 22K, uh, 25K, while failing to, to realize and appreciate the, the macro data science a perspective that's suggesting that even 35k uh, will probably do investors quite well over the long run. So Ash, what are your thoughts on Rex's view here regarding this 20 month moving average? I've heard it called the line in the sand for bull and bear markets. What what's going on with this moving average? Well, you know, once again, it's a really interesting perspective. I'm not a technical analyst. I don't generally follow Bitcoin candles, uh, but it's interesting to hear Rekt. For me, what stood out uh, was actually this idea uh, of how he's talking about the bottom. What stood out to me is that he doesn't talk about finding a bottom explicitly. He talks about this as a bottoming process. Uh, and as you pointed out, Marco, uh, on Rex's view, uh, he once again returns to that $35,000 long-term price entry target that he has. So he's very consistent about his thinking about this from the big picture perspective. And that's really what stood out uh, to me about that clip, Marco. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, with this line in the sand, when Bitcoin crossed, I believe it was the 20 month moving average, when it crossed 40,000 is when it, it dipped in. And it's like we're kind of entering this bear trend and then we're entering this bottoming process. And then he's kind of using that in conjunction with this two year moving average to kind of get an idea. Okay, well, we're below 40. And now I know we're in a bear trend. And now we're getting below 35. Is this becoming, uh, are we getting closer to the sweet spot? And so I just, I think it's a really interesting clip. And I think that brings us to our next clip here where we get a quick but full rundown of Rex's complete strategy, his dollar cost averaging, his multiple indicators he's taking a look at. Let's watch this clip. The way I constructed my dollar cost averaging, and that's essentially the best way to go about it because trying to pinpoint the absolute bottom is um let's just say it's impossible uh and it's and it's a there's no need to try and find find the absolute bottom but dollar cost averaging laddering those buys uh, those buy orders progressively um I'll, I'll, I'll shine a bit of light on on how i'm doing that exactly but i just want to highlight the three indicators that i'm paying attention to most so this is the the 20 month moving average uh breaking down below it uh, seeing price drop from uh, from the 20 month moving average, that's giving me an idea that we're going to be entering a bearish uh, phase in the market. And then number two, focusing on the two year moving average and uh, dropping below that 35K region that we were talking about, that data science model. Um, and essentially, uh, just by just focusing on it logically and not having any uh, emotions that 35k at this point in the cycle is is too high a price because bitcoin right now is 22k but back then a few weeks ago i could have just started my dollar cost averaging from 35k and 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 just ladder in progressively but at the same time i knew that the 200 week moving average is where we see downside wicking 
take place. So for me, it was more focusing on the 20 month moving average as these kind of alert signals that, okay, we're entering a bearish trend and then the two year moving average. Okay. We're entering the bottoming out process and then the 200 week moving average. Well, okay. It's getting narrower and narrower. This is where we're going to be seeing uh, prices that are close to peak opportunity downside wicking below the 200 week moving average. So anything below 20 to 800 at this point. So the way I'm laddering or at least dollar cost averaging is that I'm building these ladders of buy orders that are progressively getting um, heavier and heavier. They're heavily weighted in terms of of how much uh, USD or GBP or Euro I'd like to purchase the Bitcoin. And as as Bitcoin's price drops down, those heavier buy orders are going to, to get triggered. And this is essentially the key to successful dollar cost averaging where you're, you're able to get cheaper Bitcoin for much more. So why not use uh, a cash to accumulate at varying price levels, but also having heavier uh, cash uh, at lower orders essentially. So at this point in the cycle, I'm still accumulating. There's no doubt about that. And I'm, I'm, not necessarily sure where that absolute bottom is going to be but i'm making an educated guess that there still could be one that we're going to see a multi-month bottoming out process and once we do see some sort of capitulation wick on the monthly time frame to at least give us some sort of signaling that a generational bottom has formed i'll, I'll have that confidence that that sideways consolidation is going to take place but Anything below 35K is a great opportunity and anything below the 200 week moving average is an even better opportunity. So anything below 22,800. But above all else right now, I know that if Bitcoin dips below 20K, then that's that's kind of an immediate buy for me because right now the problem with 2020K, what was once a psychological inflection point for dramatic price expansion, we're seeing 20K kind of get normalized in the collective mind of investors and people are starting to not really appreciate the significance of that inflection point as we once did in the past because we're not really seeing accompanying volatility right now in the cycle. But we, we have to make no mistake that anything below 20K is an outsized um, opportunity for investors, even evidenced by that data science model that I've been talking about. Anything below 35K is fantastic. Well, then if anything below 35K is the bottoming out period, then anything below 20K is is getting us closer to that peak financial opportunity. And if you're a long-term investor, investor investing for the next few years as uh, dictated your your investment thesis might be dictated by the halving events. I've I've written a, a, a four part series on the halving and how it impacts a Bitcoin's price action in the Rex Capital newsletter. What we know is that we might see some sharp pre halving retraces, but of course this pre halving retrace still has a way to go. This uh, this isn't even the pre halving retrace. We'll see that probably in 2024. But the most important principle to take uh, note of is that exponential price increase occurs after the halving. And um, if you're just investing based on that, as I am, then dollar cost averaging anything below 20k is my main thesis right now, and just holding for up to a year after the halving. And it's it's really as simple as that, really. So Ash, what do you think about Rex dollar cost averaging strategy here? Like he's he's it seems like he's laddering his buy orders in such a way where he's setting the orders, you know, at lower prices, he's putting more cash in, effectively stacking on his long-term portfolio. Break down Rex strategy for us. Yeah, that's right, Marco. This is a really interesting clip because it reveals the way that he thinks about uh, dollar cost averaging and, and getting into these positions more generally. So a couple of things stood out at me. First, he looks at multiple indicators for strategic guidance, 20 month, two year and 200 week moving average. Obviously, these are all longer term moving averages. So he's looking at this uh, from a kind of a fundamental structural perspective uh, on price. And exactly as you pointed out, Marco, he also talks about laddering in. Uh, let's talk about that. Laddering is about using multiple limit orders uh, at multiple price points to enter or exit a trade, in this case, entering the trade. Uh, and that strategy works with dollar cost averaging. It's done uh, with the goal of obviously lowering your average weighted 
associated cost on your positions. Uh, so this would be opposed to, for example, like a strict price targeting strategy where you know you you uh, you set everything at a single limit order uh, to get in at a particular target uh, based upon, for example, some of your technical or indeed fundamental analysis. Uh, final point, and this is very important for then Rex's thesis. Uh, Rex points out that historically speaking. Exponential moves to the upside in the price of Bitcoin, historically speaking, have happened after halving events. Uh, again, this is interesting because it's a very long-term kind of fundamental thesis uh, from Rect that we're hearing here. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, of course, uh, that the next BTC halving event is expected in the first half of 2024, Marco. Wow. So that was a lot of fascinating points. Here's like this conversation with you has been great. It really, you really helped me break down these key takeaways, analyzing these clips. What I took away from it, the same thing that you were saying, it's wrecked capital. He's believing that anything below 35K is for Bitcoin is a great opportunity, but anything below the 200 week moving average is even better. So he's kind of layering this thing. He first, he was seeing uh, that we dropped below the 20 month moving average, that 40,000 price point. Then he's seeing that we're dropping below the 30. 35,000 on the two year moving average. And then he drops down to the 20, 200 week moving average. And he's looking for that price point. He's saying that anything below 20K is an immediate buy for him. He's also arguing that investors need to pay attention to this halving cycles, right? And like you mentioned, the there's that historically there have been exponential price increases after the halving. You know, we don't know if that's going to happen again. But you know, he's also emphasizing, and I think that something that's really interesting is the time from bear market bottoms to the next halving cycles, the amount of days. And when he's looking at this overall bottoming process, he's estimating that if we do see a lower low in Bitcoin, it could potentially happen in the fourth quarter of this year, maybe even November of this year. So yep. moving on to viewer questions, Ash, uh, the first one we have from M cubed on the RV site. Can you guys put the Solana and the bridge breaches in perspective? We've seen so many in the past few months. Is there any sig anything significant about these particular cases or are they just another exploit to chalk up to growing pains? What is your take here, Ash? Yeah, it's a great question, M cubed. Uh, look, the short answer is second verse, same as the first. We've seen this story before. We'll probably continue to see this in the future. We now know, I think with a reasonable degree of certainty, that these challenges are lurking out there. It's in the nature, the fundamental nature of the way uh, these code bases develop. There are these potentials for exploits. And I would add to that also, uh, to MCube's specific question about bridge breaches, uh, you know, based on some of the reporting that we've done here at Real Vision, uh, it very much seems that there are significant challenges with the way that the current architecture uh, of bridges are engineered. Uh, I, I don't want to be sort of painting too broad a picture here uh, in the way that I'm talking about this, but I think it's reasonable, reasonable to look at bridges with a skeptical eye. Obviously, there's some other technologies here, uh, so-called layer zero solutions, Polkadot, Cosmos, that are looking to find new ways of doing cross-chain protocols uh, that aren't based on a on a software bridge per se. I suspect we're going to probably hear more about those efforts just because of some of the challenges that we've seen to date in uh, in the in the protocols that uh, are uh, transferred uh, from one chain to another with bridges, Marco. You know, it's looking at bridges with a skeptical eye. I mean, this reminds me of your conversation with Corby Pryor, right, where he was talking about how important the consensus layer is. I mean, definitely something that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, the we next get question Corby here back to, to talk yeah. about. Absolutely. We, you know, Corby, if you're watching, you know, hit us up on our email. Uh, so Ralph Humphrey from the RV site, uh, he's asking, could Ash discuss a little bit about the CME's rollout of the euro denominated Bitcoin and Ethereum futures? What is your take on that? Great question, Ralph. Uh, look, I would say I, I don't really have any specific insights into the mechanics of the rollout. This is obviously a story that's breaking here this morning. Uh, but I will say this, 50,000 foot perspective, uh, clearly it's a sign uh, that implies broader adoption uh, of Ethereum and a broader interest in Ethereum and the ability for investors to come into uh, those uh, exposures uh, from a broader array of currencies. It's it's hard to see as this is anything uh, but big picture bullish uh, on the future of the uh, Ethereum ecosystem, Marco. 
Yeah, no, I definitely agreed. Uh, and I love that your 50,000 foot overview. I mean, you really break it down really great when it comes to that. I was I like, what, what is this guy pointing doing? out the obvious, Marco? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So the next question, again, from Ralph Humphrey. Uh, Once proof of work is gone, miners will be gone. What effect might a bunch of these professional grade computers departing the network have? You know, this is an interesting question as well. Uh, I'll give you the short answer. The short answer is nobody knows. It hasn't happened yet. This is a massive transition that's going to be taking place. He's talking about, I assume, uh, Ethereum and the merge uh, here with the transition from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, it's an it's a really interesting question about what can be done with that hash power. I think that the the sort of the way that I would think about it, at least at least broadly speaking, is you know this is an effort that's been compared uh, to swapping out the engines of a jet airplane at a cruising altitude of fifty thousand feet. Uh, so I think you know the the heart of his question is really is, is what are the externalities about this going to be? And I've I've sort of talked about this before. You can run things in testnet, even when you run things at testnet, it's something that attempts to emulate uh, some layer of uh, scale. It's really hard to know how these things shake out in production, uh, where there's actual money involved now look we, we could we should say uh, that beacon uh, chain is is running today but this is going to be a massive shift in the amount of uh, dollars at stake uh, and therefore the precise implications of exactly what's going to happen in this ecosystem are at this moment unknown well like like you said you know a lot of these things always unknown definitely something to keep an eye on well everybody that's it for today's show we got another great episode of Rao's adventures in crypto for you tomorrow we Rao sat down with Dan Moorhead of Pantera Capital and they discussed their differing opinions on the crypto and macro landscape no other conversation is more important than talking about crypto and macro obviously macro affecting us tremendously check that interview out airing tomorrow. See you next week live on Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing.